Hi, this is Bob Rucker. I just wanted to record a quick uh, thank you to all the folks who made uh, Older Coloradans Week a success. And so I will begin by uh, talking about our volunteers who actually put this whole thing together, uh, starting with Chris Gierken, who is a CSL board member, Kelly Roberts, also a CSL board member and vice president of our board, uh, Jody Waterhouse, uh, also a CSL board member and the program manager at the multidisciplinary center on aging at CU Anschutz. Try to say that really fast. Uh, Alex Gerken, our video uh, volunteer videographer. Corinne Hall, volunteer and CSL webmaster. Charlie Johnson, volunteer and uh, also works at InnovAge. Karen Brown, volunteer and Aging 2.0 Colorado, among many other things in the aging area. Uh, Rich Morrow, who's a board member and senior policy and legislative analyst at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, also known as Dr. Cog. Our sponsor was Relay Colorado. And on advocacy day, our first day, uh, our Lieutenant Governor, Diane Primavera, kicked off the week well, with a fine talk. Uh, then we had uh, panelists involved were Kelly Fritz from AARP Colorado, uh, Rich Morrow, who I mentioned earlier, Jeanette Hensley, who, who is a longtime CSL board member and volunteer. Rich and Jeanette are the co-chairs of our uh, legislative committee. Then we had the, our Voices on Aging on Tuesday. Uh, Sarah Beth Ford, uh, Nikki Delson from the Carbondale Age Friendly Community Initiative, uh, Yolanda Gautier from the Center for African American Health, former State Senator Larry Crowder, and Marilyn Husby from Time Bank of the Rockies in Montrose, and then Lydia Dumum from Dr. Cog as was Sarah Beth Ford, by the way, and Alejandra Lerma, also with Dr. Cog. And then on Wednesday morning, uh, we had our discussion on workforce and aging, uh, employing people in the aging community uh, as employees, uh, which has proved to be very difficult. Um, but we had a really good discussion on that, led by uh, Janine Vandenberg of Changing the Narrative, Andrea Kuig from the Bell Policy Center, Mike Kohler, who is with the Larimer County Economic and Workforce Development, and Diksha Nagar from the Denver Public Library. And then in our closing session on Wednesday afternoon, uh, we were joined by Representative Alec Garnett, who is also a Speaker of the House this year, and uh, had a, a very nice discussion with Alec. He spent uh, more time with us than we had planned, and we very much appreciated that. So all of the, uh, the, the different groups that were involved, and I'll go through them one more time, are uh, Changing the Narrative, uh, the Carbondale Age Friendly Community Initiative, Center for African American Health, Time Bank of the Rockies in Montrose, the Bell Policy Center, the Aging 2.0 Denver Chapter, and of course, Colorado Senior Lobby. So uh, many thanks to all the folks who participated and who joined us as attendees. Uh, we had some great discussion and came up with a lot of great ideas that uh, we will be following up on. So uh, once again, thanks to you all. Bye. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's that time. Uh, I see that we've been joined by our uh, speaker. And so I'm going to um, say hello to uh, speaker Alec Garnett. And uh, he's also our, our rich and I's uh, representative in the house. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so, Speaker, are you, are you there? I am, Bob. Thanks so much for the invite. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I, I just want to say at the outset that I have more time than uh, I think um, I carved out a little bit more time if in, in case you guys wanted. I wanted to be really sensitive to uh, everyone coming together and obviously um, answering any questions that you guys have. And so just uh, at the outset, if we wanted to go a full 30, we could. If you even want to go a little bit over 30, we could. I want to be respectful of your calendar too. So just uh, just so you know. Well, thanks for that. That's good to know. 
Um, I thought I would maybe just give a kind of brief overview of what I think we'll be focused on this session and then really open it up to questions. I know there have been some great questions that have that I'm sure at the tip top of your mind and we'll just jump right into those if that's okay. Yeah, sure, please. Awesome. Well, um, again, thanks uh, for everyone for jumping on. The, uh, these are obviously very uh, different times, uh, challenging times. Uh, Janine was talking about vacation. Uh, for the first time in a very long time, uh, my wife and I actually mentioned the word vacation, which was uh, uh, more of a reflection of the, I think, uh, I feel like I've been in session for a full year now. There really hasn't been a break with the uh, temporary adjournment last year. We had a COVID session. We had a special session. We had an election in there. Um, we've been working around the clock. Zoom has built in efficiencies that I um, wish it hadn't. Uh, I can take about 10 more meetings a day than I normally could. And sometimes that's good, but sometimes it really wears on you. I think you're going to see in the legislative session, you know, us really trying to focus in on, on recovery, trying to get us back to where we were uh, pre-pandemic. Obviously, that means, um, that means we have to get to the end of this pandemic, which means we're going to do everything we can to continue to help uh, support the governor's um, work that he's done on the vaccine framework and uh, infrastructure that's been built. You know, really, as I check in almost daily on how all of that is going, you know, we're getting, we got about a 15% increase in vaccines from the federal government in the change of administration, which is good. We're getting more consistent, timely information from the administration, which is helpful as we start to plan how to get those vaccines in the arms of Coloradans across the state. Um, really, where our infrastructure stands now, we could take about four times the number of vaccines that we're getting. Uh, and make sure that they're getting into the arms. And so that makes me feel like the we're doing what we can on the state level. And as soon as those numbers start to go up, you're going to start to see those numbers. Uh, uh, I think you're going to start to, we're going to be able to process those. We're not really having as many challenges. Now, obviously, there's nothing that's perfect. And I'm sure if any of you have had individual struggles with the process, you should feel free to either reach out to your individual legislator, or I'm happy to uh, work on an individual way to help solve any problems that you've uh, experience. Obviously, it's not perfect, but I do feel like we're in a better place than uh, many other states are. As we get into session, we have a really unique opportunity because of the tough budget choices that we made last year. Remember, when we balanced the budget, it was at the end of May at the beginning of June of 2020. That was about uh, two months later than we normally do, and it was at the height of economic uh, uncertainty of what 2020 and what this pandemic we're, we're going to mean for Colorado's economy. And so the budget economists who uh, help forecast revenue coming into the state that the J Joint Budget Committee then budgets to were very, very conservative in their estimates. And so we cut $3.3 billion out of our $13 billion discretionary general fund, which was about a 25% reduction, which is an extraordinary cut um, compared to any other uh, year in recent memory. As we got to September, we got an economic forecast from those same economists. And what we didn't realize at the time was that the federal CARES Act dollars that were coming in from the first relief package really propped up Colorado's economy during the third quarter. And revenues were actually obviously slower than they would be in a normal year, but were much, much higher than we thought they were going to be. And so uh, what has happened is the same thing happened in the December forecast. So we we are sitting in a position where we budgeted here and the revenues are actually coming in here. So we have all this one-time money that's sitting in between what we budgeted to and uh, what is the reality, but it's not ongoing money. So it's not like we can create a new program to, you know, whatever you want to make up and have it go keep going into the future in the next few fiscal years um, because obviously there's still economic uh, uncertainty on the horizon. But it does give us an opportunity to say, listen, we should do whatever we can to move money in a one-time uh, one time way to stimulate the econ economy, have a multiplying effect to help those most in need. And so we're spending a lot of time trying to understand how has this impacted, um, how has this impacted uh, different communities across the state in this pandemic uh, and, and this downturn that have, has come with it has been very, very strange. And it's very different than any other economic downturn that we've had in the state before. You have some industries 
you have the hospitality industry in particular that's in complete shock mode. We're not in a situation where they can even they, they see the light of the tunnel and things are getting slightly better, but it's been very, very, very challenging. And we have small businesses that are closing. We have restaurants that are closing. You have workers who normally would transition if they lost a job in a restaurant, they would transition into retail. Well, retail is feeling some of the same shock that the restaurant industry is. And so there's this like, there's this one sector that's been just really, really hurt. Then at the same time, uh, at the same time, you have other industries, you have the tech industry, where behaviors before 2020 were kind of moving slowly in one direction. And then all of a sudden, because of the pandemic, have been put on fast forward. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and I haven't told anyone this publicly, but my wife's also pregnant. We get everything delivered to our house foods delivered right we have groceries delivered because she's pregnant and like i'm on zoom all day so we have no time to do anything so everything's getting delivered to the house food diapers you name it and so that behavior like maybe we were doing a little bit of that before but now it's been put on fast forward and so consumers behaviors have changed over the last year so taking all that into consideration the legislature has an opportunity to use some one-time dollars to chase uh, to chase them into spots in the economy that have uh, uh, really been hit badly and that are not being supported by federal relief that are coming in. So that's what I think you'll see the legislature come out of the gate with. There's other big things that um, have stumped the legislature in the past that aren't directly related to COVID that I think you'll see us um, continue to work on. Obviously, healthcare costs remain incredibly high for Coloradans across uh, different regions of the state. Pharmaceutical costs remain incredibly high for uh, consumers across the state, and no one should have to make you know very impossible choices between whether or not they need to ration pharmaceutical you know ration their uh, their pharmaceutical drugs or uh, you know put their health at risk. Transportation is another issue that I kind of talk I kind of joke around, and I shouldn't joke around this way, but you know as speaker you inherit. Uh, the white whale of transportation. And my colleagues don't like me saying this because we actually think we might be able to get something done this year, but at the end of Moby Dick, the white whale gets away and, and the captain dies. And so um, maybe I shouldn't refer uh, like that, but our transportation needs and our transportation infrastructure have not been updated in like the last decade. And as uh, we know, uh, the infrastructure needs are not only piling up in terms of you know, bridges that need repair, roads that need uh, repair, but the, the, uh, we know that our transportation needs in the future are gonna be changing. We need to future proof how we are generating uh, revenue that's coming into the state uh, to make sure that we are ready and prepared for those changes that are coming. Just like behavior of the consumers changing, the way that people are using the roads is changing. Now it's Uber and Lyft and it's Uber Eats these folks are using the roads without uh, and putting uh, wear and tear on the roads without actually compensating and putting money into the pot to help fix them. And so we have to make sure we are um, taking all those in uh, all those new needs and future needs into consideration as we th think through transportation funding. There's a lot of other issues around housing. There's a lot of other issues uh, that I think we will continue to tackle a lot of education issues. The most important thing to um, uh, to keep in mind is that uh, some of the programs that you rely on um, and, and seniors across the uh, state rely on uh, were cut last year. What we're doing um, is really providing the flexibility to uh, the Joint Budget Committee to go back in and help restore um, some of those cuts that were uh, made last year. And so I think those are some of the big buckets that you'll see uh, the legislature focus on as we come back in next Tuesday. Um, obviously, you know, what is different is how all of you participate um, in, uh, um, yeah, and, and Phil has a good question about uh, uh, one-time dollars to help capital and infrastructure. Any ideas that you may have uh, please shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the um, uh, in the chat. Uh, but yeah, one-time infrastructure, shovel-ready 
you know, how do we get dollars in, stand stuff up quickly, create jobs like that? That is what we're kind of looking for. So let me um, put my email in there. One thing that is very different is how all of you interact with the legislature. Obviously, um, you guys have usually have a great big day at the Capitol um, as things are changing. Um, you know, uh, you know the way you interact uh, with the legislature changes. What is what has not changed is the fact that the legislative process is so reliant on all of your um, participation. You know, I'm not going to have all the. You know, I'm a I'm a good referee, right? Uh, but I don't have all the ideas out there. And if, and if you, and, and that's what we rely so much on all of you to participate in the process. And I know so much of that has changed. We have, you know, tried to increase opportunities for remote participation. So last special session for the first time in the history of Colorado, people were able to testify remotely, which sounds uh, pretty common sense, right? Especially in the world of Zoom. But in terms of changing an institution that has done stuff one way for 146 years, you know, there are, you know, it, it was the big step forward. Now it wasn't perfect. And there were some technical difficulties that have been hopefully smoothed over uh, since uh, December. Um, and then we also tried to open up easier ways for people to submit written testimony, which also is not necessarily, uh, wasn't ex exactly perfect during the special session either, but people are working on uh, to continue uh, to um, make that easy and, uh, and for, uh, I'm going to encourage our committee chairs to, to recognize all of that. So if you're tuning in remotely, you can, you know, you feel confident that your testimony has reached the people that you want it to reach. So those are some of the things that have changed. What, what hasn't changed is that the building will be open uh, to the public. We'll continue to socially distance and we'll continue to be wearing masks and, and prioritize public health. So if there was something where you know, you didn't want to participate remotely or you wanted to come down to meet with me in person because I had really done something that you didn't like or whatever the need was. The building's going to be open. You're going to have access to come in and, and it's just going to be a little bit different in terms of, um, you know, obviously the feelings you have as you walk in um, and that's pretty much just the way it is everywhere. And so the capital is not going to be much different. So I'll kind of stop rambling. That was a long uh, 15 minute ramble. And if I was only here for 15 minutes, it would have been a pretty strategic way of avoiding <laughs> the tough questions. Uh, but thanks again for the invite. It's an honor. I've always wanted to be um, invited uh, to senior lobby day ever since I was a, a little baby legislator. And so um, I really appreciate it. And, and thanks for the opportunity. Well, you're, you're probably the only legislator that has had that with since you were a baby, you know, <laughs> to, to get invited. Uh, so um, how many of the legislators will actually be in the Capitol in person as opposed to remotely? I think for the most part, the vast majority will be in person. There will be, you know, I think people, people have obviously, I mean, one area of the economy that I feel really sensitive to are multi-generational households where people uh, face the impossible choice of going to work um, and, 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 and putting family members at risk. And, um, and so there are people who uh, have those um, real concerns. For the most part though, I think people are gonna be participating in person. Um, again, the most effective way uh, to get the work done will be in person, uh, but the opportunities will be there to participate in floor work and committee work uh, remotely if, if, if needed um, and to maximize social distancing. Uh, but I think for the most part, uh, uh, at any one time out of the 65 members of the house, maybe one or two will be remote. Um, I think it will be less than it was in the last two COVID sessions that we had. Okay. Uh, another question I have is, um, how do we get more legislators to take an interest in, um, in the issues of older Coloradans? I mean, it's something that we've struggled with actually for a very long time. Um, and I thought maybe you could offer some suggestions about how we might be able to do that. Uh, you guys should start giving awards out. I don't know, I'm serious and this sounds so weird, but like legislators love trophies and they like put them up in their office and you should find a way to recognize uh, one or two legislators maybe even four if you wanted to, what Democrat and Republican from the House and Democrat and Republican from the Senate every year, have them come 
at first maybe it will be like, you know, I don't know, you figure out something that you want to recognize them for, a bill that they ran, something, something that pops out. But uh, then that award starts showing up in their offices and their colleagues will walk in and they'll see the award and you can make it kind of distinct from others. Um, some like the, like the community, like the independent bankers have a horseshoe that's like upside, it's a spur actually. Um, oh, well, like you walk in and like the restaurant association has like a frying pan. Oh, well, you walk in and I immediately recognize the award. And then all of a sudden I got a frying pan and I was like so honored to get it. Oh, well, and it's so, it sounds so dumb. It sounds like I'm like a, like a middle schooler collecting soccer trophies or something, but literally um, uh, all politicians have an obsess, uh, like a, have a, an obsession with themselves and have a weird relationship with power and trophies somehow satisfy that. And it's a way to, I think, build up the brand a little bit and to give recognition and have people keep coming back. Okay. Well, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I remember in the past, you know, getting awards in my work life and I, I didn't know, or, you know, I guess I just didn't appreciate them enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everyone's, everyone thinks they're going to be president of the United States, though, at the Capitol. So, you know, and that's, yeah, you know, that, that is a difference. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. Um, I saw another question pop up here. Um, how many of us there are? Uh, that would be people over the age of 50. So there, there are 2 million people in Colorado now who are over the age of 50. And that, and that number does continue to grow. Um, so uh, we, yeah, we have that. Um, part of the discussion we had, uh, Senator, ex-Senator Crowder was on um, our session yesterday. Uh, we, we actually recorded a few people from around the state uh, which, which turned out really well. And then we had an opportunity to have some discussion around that. So uh, one of his comments, and, and I, I happen to agree with this, is that um, we need a lot more you know, volunteering because you know, the state doesn't have the money to continue to, to do everything. Um, it probably never will. But, and you know, we struggle every year with AAA funding. We, we know that. Uh, so we, we have that is one thing. But but then, you know, we heard a lot about uh, issues with immigrants who come here and don't speak our language, don't speak English. Um, they need, you know, training, uh, education on being able to speak English. Some people come here high, with highly, highly educated, but they can't do anything with their education because they don't speak the language. And, uh, you know, when you were talking about the one-time money, I was thinking, well, maybe that's a way to put some of it to use is to actually pay for some, you know, very concentrated effort on getting some of these people up to speed on, uh, on speaking English. So uh, that would be one thing, but then, so I guess, you know, the whole idea of the volunteers is, um, can you think of any way for the state to encourage more volunteerism? is a good question i saw it um maybe in the questions you sent over yesterday i saw it somewhere um that was in there i don't know off the top of my head unless there was a way to um uh unless there was a way to promote and like educate, right? Like the states put together education campaigns in the past that have been pretty successful and have changed behavior. Um, they're usually on like public health related issues, but uh, maybe that's one way. You guys have a good relationship with the Gov's office and so, and with the administration, that might be one place to leverage, you know, is there opportunity to create, you know, not a huge campaign at first, but maybe to build a messaging campaign around it and, um, I mean, that's one way we've changed behavior on the state level before. Okay. All right. Um, we had another question here. Um, I don't know what that means. Colorado volunteer mobilization exists. So Kim Hayes, um, you sent this in. Could you could you speak a little bit more about that, please? 
Uh, it's, a, it's a group, um, maybe it's more medically based, but it was sent to me by the um, health department in Fort Collins. And you apply and you have all of this demographic information that you give them. And they're like, oh, great, you're a volunteer. And then they don't actually ask you to do anything. <laughs> It sounds like the Democratic Party. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so maybe like, yeah, I mean, I guess um, that's always an issue too. I mean, maybe there's a way to um, uh, to like be the hub of the information and, and have a little bit more focus on how to be responsive to the information that um, they get. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, those are the types of ideas. I mean, it, there are nonprofits across the state that are doing this, I mean, that are showing us the model that this does work. And, and I, so I agree, I agree with uh, the goal here. Um, so we, let me, you know, I'd like to keep thinking about it. It's a, it's a very good question. Yeah, well, and, and we've got some comments here from different people about uh, volunteer efforts, but, you know, and, and each one of them has their own kind of volunteer core. I mean, I'm very familiar with a little help, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and and then there's Spark to Change and, and, and AmeriCorps and several others. But you know, there, there hasn't really been, that, that I've seen anyway, any concerted effort on the part of the state government to really promote volunteerism. Because um, you know, we can never spend our way out of the hole that we're in. I, mean, I, I don't see how we can. <laughs> you know, you mentioned the, the one-time money is one-time money, but you know, the general fund money is not, you know, it's not growing, not at least not this year. <laughs> oh, and if we keep passing tax cuts at the ballot, it's going to keep decreasing, which is challenging. Yes, yeah, indeed it is. Um, you know, uh, so I, I see a hand up here. Uh, Alva, go ahead, please. Just, uh, make two comments. First of all, very general viewpoint, and the second one, more specific senior, senior viewpoint. The general viewpoint, there's a great yearning to go back to normal and people hunt. And that would be very nice. But I think there's huge pressures, the, the viruses, the global warming, the sixth extinction, the economic thing, the rural urban thing that are gonna keep shaking this thing for a lot longer. And there's going to be enormous need to change. And just confronting that will help make those changes in an intelligent and rational way. From my specific viewpoint as a senior, what I have sort of decided after these three useful days is I'm going to try to listen everywhere I can, newspapers, radio, uh, web pages, to what among this 200 million senior seniors, which things seem to be working and which things seem to not be working? And then maybe this, this group here or some of the other groups that have participated here can use that insight to give real data into the legislation and the governor's office and the courts or whatever. So those are the two forks I'm going to work on. Thanks, Alba. Much appreciated. I, I see a couple of other things in the chat. Do, do you want to comment on any of those, uh, Alec? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think um, uh, I there's a lot of focus on uh, workforce development as like a bucket of one-time money that we need to be spending to help um, uh, uh, to help folks um, who have been displaced during the pandemic. And so I think if there's a way for us to, to, to be more specific in, in what we're referring to and having, um, you know, uh, older Coloradans uh, have, having some, um, having older Coloradans kind of focused in um, as one of those line items within that bucket on workforce, I think is a very, very, very uh, timely um, idea. And I think it's certainly an experience that, I, that many people went through after the recession of 2008 my mother-in-law in particular, never actually recovered um, from uh, the job loss that came and the inability to uh, 
uh, get back into kind of the stable workforce that she was in before. So I do think it's something that we need to pay particular attention to. And so I really appreciate that. And um, whether or not it's, um, you know, you know, uh, paid certifications or apprenticeships or other types of technology training, like, you know, send, like, I'll, I'll take that idea into the little think tank and um, see, see what we can do. It's a very, very uh, good, timely point. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Um, I'm, a, I'm a strong proponent of coalitions and in every county or region there is an area agency on aging and if they made a point of hooking up with their state legislator and providing a list of all the organizations and services that are available to seniors and kind of coordinated just a local coalition and got the information to their state representative and or state senator, it would make a huge difference because there are lots of organizations. I volunteer for a legislator and none of them Which come one? to Which our one? office. What? Which, Which one? Rep Froelich. Oh, good. She's a good one. So, but none of them come into our office. None of the aging people show up. If they made a point of their neighborhood and keeping a list and showing up, we'd get more recognition. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think, um, do, you, do you see, Alec, do you see a, a reluctance uh, on the part of just people in general to reach out and get to know you? Do you have to make more of an effort on your side or, or less effort? How, how does that work? The amazing thing is, and it's very humbling actually, no one knows what the state legislature does, right? People are, people just, they know, they know that if they, they, they have, a, and it's because of the pioneering spirit of Coloradans, right? So, you know, my, my family, I'm putting a speech together for Tuesday. So I've been doing all this, uh, I've been, I'm a fourth generation Colorado, but, you know, my family came over to Colorado after the Civil War. You know, they had such distrust for centralized power at, in any governmental level. We've really always had a local control spirit here in the state. You know, I, this is a funny story. Do you know it only took 10 signatures to create a school district uh, between statehood and 1950? We had 2,000 at the height. In 1950, we had 2,540 uh uh, school districts. Then we went through like 40 years of reform and we still have too many. We have 178. We have 12 in El Paso County, which is just... Yeah, just I thought 178 was too many. <laughs> I know. We just burn too much uh, uh, precious dollars that don't get into the classroom because there's too many administrative offices, but whatever. Uh, point is, yeah, I mean, I think people, people, you know, the, 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 the older Coloradans that are very close to me are the ones that are really active either in the party or that are really active in their community. Now my door has been open and I have created some like great opportunities for older Coloradans who have, you know, come in once a week and started volunteering in my office. I think sometimes, and um, I'm sure Marcia can kind of relate to this, you know, we don't really have structure in our office. And so like I end up just taking on everything and then it's hard for me to delegate and, and all of that. But we have, there have been a few instances where older Coloradans have come in and volunteered with me where we've accomplished great things. I mean, one of my um, HD2 officers started volunteering. We were contacted by a dad, somebody who they thought was eligible for clemency and to get out of the Department of Corrections. We worked our tails off and like, I mean, the governor let him out and like we cried together when there was like this like just amazing moment. And so like what I would encourage, like in terms of like ways of feeling, um, like you're making a difference, there's really no better place to go than the legislature. If you are a retired person or somebody who's just trying to fill a day in your schedule, um, there's no better place to go than trying to connect with your legislator because there are things on the side that you really can do to make a huge impact and to feel really good about being a part of your community. And so we could do a better job. I mean, one thing that um, CSU did for like 100 years and Rich I can't remember the dude's name because he, he retired but he set up this internship program mm. for 
uh, CSU students to get bussed oh, down. Yeah, that was John, John, John. I got to think of his last name. Yeah. He was a professor. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Well, like, why don't we set up the same thing? Like, why don't why do why doesn't this group set up a a relationship with the legislature where people just sign up and then you and then we all work to place those folks who sign up into legislative offices, Democrats, Republicans, it doesn't really matter. It's, I mean, maybe it matters more than college students because people might have pretty strong views, but then that's okay. But like, let's set up a program to get people into the Capitol, into these offices, to make a difference, to, to be better advocates for the issues that they care about. But, but um, it, it, it's worked. It just takes a lot of work to get it off the ground. But once you set that up, it can be really successful. That sounds like a grant opportunity. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Maybe with next 50 or uh, somebody mm -hmm. like that. Rep Froelich has three older persons, older adults, as volunteers in her office. Like you. It's great. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, do we have any other questions for our, uh, our speaker today? Um, well, I had a question or comment. I see Kim's hand up, but if I may, uh, since you already had a chance to talk. No, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, we can do both. Yeah, we can do both. Good. Um, I wanted to um, actually, I was going to comment on what you just talked about, uh, Alec. Um, and I think that's a great idea as far as getting more people involved down at the legislature. And I was also going to pick up on your comment about uh, future proofing funding for transportation. Um, we're also working on, I think it's a good way to say it, is future, trying to future proof funding for the area agencies on aging. And I think almost everybody on this call has heard me talk about it ad nauseum over the years. Um, but uh, the uh, in the, the state budget, um, you know, we have a combination of Federal Older Americans Act funding and state uh, general fund and uh, some cash funds in uh, the budget. And uh, we took a pretty big hit in one sense in uh, last session that uh, we ended up with uh, flat funding overall for a program, but we had $18 million of uh, cash fund balance that had to be swept to help balance the budget last year, which we understood and we actually, you know, like everybody else probably reluctantly supported doing that because we knew it needed to be done. Uh, but we do have a, a concern about the budget, uh, the way it was, it was initially submitted for this year, uh, where another $10 million is being taken uh, to create general fund savings. And so, and it's being, re again, being replaced with one-time monies, but if that were to go through between last year and if this goes through this year, uh, we'd see some real instability starting to creep in to our funding in that line item. Our, uh, our general fund amount uh, will, would be cut down from about 15 million to almost 7 million. And so right now it's being replaced with almost $8 million of one-time funds. So that's something that would create a huge burden, I think, on the JBC to come up with enough money in the following, you know, next year's budget, the 22-23 budget to make that whole. Um, and so it started thinking about, um, even though we know the funding environment is still volatile and, and we never know for sure what's going to happen, but it is looking better than what it was. And your comments about there being, you know, opportunity to use some of this one-time funding, maybe for, you know, for certain things, maybe that some of that funding can be used to help replace the one-time funding from last year and this year to help uh, even out that that budget. Um, and I'd be happy to email you or talk to you in more detail about that. But we are having conversations with Joint Budget Committee members about that issue. And I think they're receptive on it. Yeah. No, I, thanks, Rich. I think it's a really important point. I, I think there's a lot of flexibility in there to, um, to not necessarily uh, follow um, all the govs uh, you can call it whatever you want. It's more like a budget cut uh, than it is 
savings, however you want to call it, whatever. Point well, is, if it's not it, a national cut this year, it's certainly possible cut next year. Yeah, yeah. And some of the, but some of the savings that are that are put in there as savings are uh, cuts this year. But I think working with the JVC is a great opportunity. I, I do think that there's uh, flexibility and opportunity to uh, structure things for 21, 22 in a way that minimizes um, uh, out year um, uh, concern, out year uh, uh, pessimism, out year anxiety. And so taking that opportunity now makes a lot of sense. So feel free to email me and then just keep me in the loop on how those conversations with JBC are going. And if there's ways that I can lend my support, I'm always talking with them and, and happy to do so. Great, thank you. We had a hand, another hand up, uh, Kim. Okay, well, I'll try to be quick. I think the two things kind of segue. One is the morning session. Um, somebody made the comment about stories being kind of episodic and promoting things that are not necessarily evidence-based. Chris is nodding your head. I don't remember who it's something about the oil and gas oversight committee got started because someone's house burned up or blew up. It's like, okay, that really wasn't a evidence-based thing. And the next part I was going to say in terms of funding for um, employment of, of experienced or older workers, Janine can speak much better to this than I, but it's one of the initiatives that gives back so strongly to the economy and funding. When you put people to work, they spend money, they pay taxes, they, they contribute to the bottom line. And so it's not, maybe seed money is, is a good idea because then you're initiating, you know, much more of a support. But I think of all of the things that we go out and look and ask for money for, the employment piece has such great potential to add back, you know, to the economy in such a strong and, and important way. So that's my that's my pitch. And Janine can say much more. Thank you, Dan. No, I'm just gonna say thank you. Well said. I I think it's great. I listen, I've been um, you know, uh my little five-year-old got this thing from National Geographic where you like can like it's like a fossil thing where you like dig around for these fossils. I'm like constantly trying to find these good ideas. I'm like, what can we honestly do to help help the workforce and think about again, put the finger on the pulse of of who's really been impacted. And so this has been super helpful. I really appreciate it, and I will certainly take those ideas back. How are you doing on time, uh, Alec? Uh, I can probably take one more and then um, I probably have to jump after that. Okay. Do we have one more question? Anyone? I, I, I saw something in the chat that could possibly be a question. Um, Bob, this is Phil. Yeah, Phil, go uh, ahead. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Alec, for being here with us. Uh, question is, um, as the average age of the legislature continues to seem uh, uh, to move younger, uh, how do we or how can we help more legislators be aware of the number of seniors across the state and the needs or priorities of seniors across the state? Good question, Phil. Another idea, you could try to set up, um, you know, when things are normalized, usually one way of um, finding consistent, you want to find like consistent ways of, um, of um, getting your ideas and attention into the little peanut sized brains of us legislators. And one of those ways is by like setting up a caucus and I can't remember if you guys have had a caucus set up before in the past, but uh, sometimes with term limits, everything's impossible, right? So not only like all the relationships we're building right now, like in two years, I'm already the future former speaker, right? It's like already almost over, but and you guys will continue to build those relationships with the next round. And I think, um, you know, there's like the clock caucus, for example, that's all focused in on um, animal will welfare. And you find a Democrat and a Republican chair of the caucus and then once a month, they hold a lunch and it allows you guys to come in and build an agenda that you work with them on. And then somehow there's like lunch provided. You got to provide food because like that's the way into the into the mind, the peanut brain of the legislators, right? You got to you give them lunch and they'll show up and then it gives you like an audience. And then over the legislative session, you have a couple, four, five, six 
caucus meetings, you start to build these relationships with the individual legislators. And then from that point, it really is um, uh, an opportunity then to um, start coming with an agenda or coming with, you know, you just want a place, a consistent place where um, I can go and continue to learn and that I can go and I feel safe asking questions that may feel dumb or, you know, that I otherwise wouldn't know. And, um, and so, you know, caucus is a place that, you know, there's um, the rural, the outdoors caucus or like the, the, um, there's like an outdoor games men's caucus. I don't know, like people were focused on hunting and fishing. And then, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, th it feels to me like this is gone a little bit by the wayside. And it's probably just because we've had these extraordinarily uh, bizarre years in terms of normalcy, uh, both in, you know, 2019, you know, it was a crazy session. And in 2020, obviously there was COVID. So I think there's an opportunity to, to, to work with individual legislators to set up those caucuses. Members are always trying to, you know, take the lead on something. And so I'd be happy to work with Rich on trying to find who those members may be. Um, but then, it, and then once a month, you guys can all come down. You don't need to sing your lobby day. You just come down to the Capitol on the day of the caucus and, um, and you guys get to sit in the room and, and, and participate. And it's just a nice way of building that, those relationships. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thanks for, for spending the time with us, uh, considerably more than, than we thought we were going to get. So we appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Anything for you guys. Thanks so much for the yeah, invite. Thank really you very it. much. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, folks. Um, so you heard a lot there. Um, does anybody have any comments that they would like to make on anything that you that you've heard? He's very open to listening. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's a pretty easy guy to talk to. Um, not all of them are like that, <laughs> so so that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to. Uh, step through a little bit of uh, what we've seen in the last couple of days and give everybody a chance to uh, to talk about anything that comes to your mind re related to uh, to what I'm going to share here. So I, I put this uh, this together pretty quickly this morning, uh, just kind of a recap of uh, where we've been this last few days. Uh, we started with the lieutenant governor. She talked about the importance of advocacy. Um, of course, the vaccine thing is a hot topic right now. Um, Speaker Garnett just talked about how things are going to work at the Capitol. So if we're brave enough and we've been vaccinated enough, I, I guess we can go down there and do our thing. Um, building relationships. Um, we, we just spent some a good bit of time talking about that. And uh, there really is a strong need for uh, all of us and in, in I mean, all of us, all 2 million of us actually over the age of 50 to, uh, to start reaching out and building those relationships with their own representatives and, and senators. And uh, we have a list of every single one of them by district and with their contact information, how many um, older people live in, the, in their district, which I'm sure many of them don't know. And um, we're happy to share that. I'm, I'm going to show that to you right now so you can see what it looks like. Um, so <clears throat> we got a little help from legislative staff and, and some of our own volunteers to put this together. So as you can see, you start here with Senate District 1, uh, just read across. Um, you know, you do have to know what district you're in, but that's not too hard to find out. So it gives you the total population for in that district is, which is pretty consistent because that's the way it's built. But then you get into um, the number of people that are that are in that those age groups, and the share of the population in that particular district. And you're going to see some pretty significant differences between many of these districts as you look through this. And I think we can we can use this to uh, actually start start a conversation with with these. And Bob, you're going to share this with us. Yeah, yeah, I, I can. I will. Yeah, I'll, we'll put it on. We'll like an extraordinary on. resource. 
Yeah, we'll put it on the senior lobby uh, website where it'll be accessible. Great. Um, there's another one. Um, this one actually shows, and I don't, this one's not as quite as valuable as the other one, but this one shows the population of the state by county, mm -hmm. um, it, it, which is, you know, here's Dolores County with 2,000 people, you know, in the whole county. So when you have, when you have some of these conversations about AAAs, here in Colorado, uh, some of the AAAs that we have, you know, maybe have one or two people on the staff and they're covering, you know, six to eight to 10 counties. Mm -hmm. So they spend a lot of time behind the windshield of a car. Um, but this also gives, gives a, a good breakdown of the number of people in each age group in each county, mm -hmm. which is different obviously than the, the Senate and representative districts. Um, and it also gives you a pretty good idea of how many of these, th this is my designation, the ones that are in yellow. Uh, well, I, I went through this and said, well, okay, these are probably, they're mostly rural counties. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're yellow. Um, and so mo and most of the counties in Colorado are rural counties. You know, we have 64 counties and we, you know, we have maybe a dozen that are, that we would consider to be more urban. So, um, and that's just the way things are. So, um, and we can, uh, we can put these on the, the website, that one on the website as well. Um, so back to this, um, we talked about um, priorities again, uh, healthcare and related transportation. Uh, we are working on some bills related to, to these things. Um, we'll, we'll see how they turn out. Um, the value of older Coloradans piece. I, I wanted to be sure that everybody has seen that. This is on the website too. And we have recently, um, we're gonna make paper copies of this to distribute in the legislature. So one thing I didn't know, and I, I do now, is that you have to get a signature of a representative or a senator before, you know, it has to be on the paper before you can get it distributed. So we have Alec Garnett's signature for the, the representatives. Uh, I still have to get one for the Senate, which I'll probably get done this week. And then we'll, we'll make the copies and get them down to the Capitol uh, next week so they can be distributed. So we had a small team of uh, volunteers um, who worked on this for quite a, quite a several weeks actually to try to pull all of this data together and create information out of the data that was easy to, to see and understand. So it starts with um, you know, a little bit of demographic information and then it gets into the economic impact of older Coloradans on the state, uh, consumer spending, et cetera, um, all the money that's paid by people 65 and over on sales income and property taxes, uh, you know, $3 billion, which is coincidentally the amount of money that was cut out of the last budget. Um, the economic, uh, the contributions volunteer activities and caregiving and informal services and so forth. How many older Coloradans own their homes, which is, you know, 80%, you know, the, which reminds me of the 20% who have been renting their entire lives for the most part. Um, this is a, a, you know, this is something, this is a weapon that we just don't, we haven't been using very well. I mean, 88% of us vote. Um, and we need to keep reminding our legislators of that. Uh, I, I think we get taken for granted. 33% um, of older Coloradans over 60 are still in the workforce. Um, Janine talked about this number this morning, 71.8 years you know, for average retirement in Colorado. And this, you know, um, over the next you know, by 2030, you know, 
well, triple the number of people over 65 who are working. So um, this is the information that we're, that we're going to be providing. Uh, we have the small team is, is reassembling. You know, we thought, well, th there's probably more we can do with this. Um, you know, create another one of these to focus in a different area or something. So um, if anybody's interested in being involved in that, uh, you certainly can. So we have a few, uh, let's see a couple of chats here. I don't think they have anything to do with this though. Okay. Um, so back to kind of the recap um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop here for just a moment and see, does anybody have any co comments or questions about anything I've talked about so far? Bob, I just love that fact sheet. It's like, I wanna blast it everywhere. Yeah, it, they, uh, the folks really did a nice job with it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so then uh, on on day two, you know, we heard some comments about you know older people want to be relevant. I mean, I, I think that's a very strong statement. It's two words: being relevant. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can be relevant by working. You can be relevant by volunteering. Um, you know, uh, pr probably you know, be relevant in other ways. But you know. That's the key thing. Um, we talked a lot about volunteering, you know, with with Alec, um, because we can't expect too much from the government. Um, you know, these these um, the triple A's were set up in 1965, basically, in the Older Americans Act. So security started, you know, as you mentioned this morning, Janine, in 1935, and so we've we've created this kind of culture built around those two things that is really hard to change. And, and I know Janine knows that she's up against it every every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we talked about, you know, the time bank of the Rockies, you know, and having a passion for supporting the community and the fact that you're really never too old to volunteer. Um, you know, uh, Representative Mary Young talked about that. Uh, get back to that. So I, I thought this was pretty interesting right here. Uh, what, uh, former Senator Crowder said that the job of the legislator is to assist people to make lives better. Um, I hope that that's true for all the legislators. Who knows? Um, the other thing he said was that state level legislation basically paints everybody gray. Uh, and that there, there are so few distinctions that are made for differences in um, uh, minorities, uh, race, sex, gender, you know, the whole thing. Um, immigrants, you, you know, none, none of those things are really covered very well by legislation unless it's extremely specific. Um, we're looking to, you know, there's, there are opportunities, there should be at least, to develop more interaction between youth and, uh, and the older population, um, which will help, you know, over time to break down some of those stereotypes that, that still exist. I mean, I, I don't know about you folks, but I mean, <clears throat> if, if I walk into a, a, a restaurant, you know, like a Wendy's or something like that, and they look at my hair and, and they, you know, it's, automatically, you know, I get the senior discount. So, so it's like, you don't have to ask for it. Um, <clears throat> the health disparities in lower income areas, we talked a lot about that yesterday too. Uh, the food deserts, this is a term that I've heard many times recently. And there's actually, if you go on the USDA website, you can actually find a map of all the food deserts in the country. Uh, and zero in on a state. And it's surprising how many of those food deserts exist in urban areas. Um, you know, the whole issue of affordable housing, which is constantly coming up. Um, you know, Denver, the city council of Denver just passed uh, um, and the new zoning uh, ordinance uh, on Monday night on um, group living and uh, it was very controversial, but um, but it passed by a vote of 11 to two. So um, we're, uh, we're all going to get to see how that works out. Uh, ostensibly, the idea behind it is to provide, you know, more opportunities for affordable housing. So uh, 
hopefully it, it works. Um, I talked about the, uh, the lifetime renters already, the immigrants, immigrant issues. That, I mean, this is something that I frankly hadn't thought much about until I, I heard uh, this folks speaking about it yesterday. And um, I can understand why it's a big issue. Uh, having traveled in some other countries uh, and not being able to speak their language. I mean, you kind of just expect everybody to, to know English, you know, and it's like they don't. <laughs> so it's uh, it's really hard to communicate. And so I, I can, you know, I can imagine how difficult it is for people who move here and can't speak the language. So um, the, the, the helping low income adults get access to resources. You know, okay, so Alejandra, who works with Dr. Cog talked about that. And you know, the fact that you know, we, we still have people here that have been here 15 or 20 years who are still in a sponsorship program, not citizens yet, um, and therefore don't qualify for a lot of um, programs. And the fact that Dr. Cog has the resources to do that and probably um, maybe one other AAA in the entire state might have those kind of resources. So that's a that's an issue. Um, see another chat popped up here. Okay, okay, that's and then finally, you know, this morning, um, Janine uh, and the group talked about you know, workforce issues and um, the fact that there's going to be a bill presented to modify the Colorado Age Discrimination Act. Uh, we'll get a, get a chance to look at that when it gets drafted. Um, talked about opportunities to show value to employers by, you know, older, older adults. Um, we talked to, you know, we just talked to uh, our speaker about the uh, retraining and new certifications and maybe spending some of that one-time money for that. Um, and he seemed very open to uh, entertaining the idea. Um, we talked about the fact that age discrimination is, it's almost impossible to prove, and you know, particularly on the hiring end of it, um, and, and that we have to show the advantages of hiring older workers. Um, that's a continuous process. And then finally, you know, um, and, and I can speak to this from my own experience, is that being able to identify, the, you know, the skills and experiences that that you have from a, a job that may be totally unrelated to something that, that you could be doing, uh, it takes a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of thought, you know, to, to bring that, bring those things out so that you can really see them and say, you yeah, know, you know, I can do, I can do something totally different than I've ever done in my life because I have these skills that I learned in this other, in this other world. So <clears throat> I, I think that's something that, you know, it's something that I've noticed in, in working with uh, people over the years is that, it's just something that people miss. Um, they they, they kind of get stuck in a box and don't even realize they're in it. So, so that's kind of the uh, the wrap up. And um, I think we have a lot of good ideas about actions that we can take. And we heard some more from uh, from Alec a little while ago. Um, I've heard this thing about awards before. I I, I never really thought it was. <laughs> that important, but apparently it is. So uh, we'll have to, to do something about that. Um, so I'll stop here. And does anybody have any comments they would like to make? I, I've just got a question since um, I have, I've, I know Colorado Senior Lobby's existed for decades. So in the past, has Colorado Senior Lobby ever uh, facilitated a caucus, as Alec had mentioned to us, recommending doing a caucus? Uh, I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, I know that SAPCA, uh, the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging, they organized a, what they called an, uh, I think they called it an aging caucus um, mm -hmm. a couple of years in a row, but it was very poorly attended. Yeah, Bob's right, yeah. And so, it's fallen by the wayside now that could be something that senior lobby ought to discuss 
decide whether or not it's it's appropriate for us to try to promote something like that. Rich and Bob, do you have a sense of why it was poorly attended or uh, what, didn't, what worked and what didn't work? Well, they, they provided food, you know, so that was, you know, that was one, one thing that was, that, was, that was good. But then the, uh, the, the people who showed up, um, it was chaired by uh, Senator Janal. And so she was always there. I mean, you know, she's a big, big believer in, you know, working on aging related issues because, you know, she is one. And then um, there were a couple of other people who were fairly consistent, but then others would just come in and they'd stay for a minute and then they'd, they'd walk out. Yeah. Um, so. Bob, this is Phil. I, yeah, I Phil. Think, I think what Alec was talking about, though, is something that is not once a year, but more regular during the session. Right. Yeah, he was. And I'll say I've I've had experience with a couple of other caucuses too. Um, and in my experience, one of the other factors that I think is is important is that you have a caucus that has um, some sort of staffing and uh, whether if it's um, a legislator who's so committed to the idea that they make sure their staff are involved in, in organizing the meetings and the caucus meetings and the topics or you have an outside staff. I mean, I've, I've, I was involved in one on uh, transportation years ago, which ironically, as big as transportation is, I don't think there's been a transportation caucus in a long time at the legislature. Uh, but many years ago, there was. And it was usually um, lobbyists who were helping to organize the caucus and, and get speakers and, and so forth. Um, so whether if it's that or senior lobby or SAPCA or uh, legislative aides or some combination of all of the above, I think that's a critical part to somebody to actually do the work. Um, so Rich, is the glue that a certain number of legislators are the caucus or is it a group of people who are the caucus who invite legislators? I know, rookie question, I'm trying to figure no, out. No, that's this. fine. I, I think the general idea is that you get a core group of legislators who are uh, interested in that topic and want to be like a quote officially uh, member of that caucus. Um, there may there probably are a whole bunch of them like Alec was starting to talk about and uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of others that I, I'm not even aware of because I don't work in those areas but you know we recently um, and part of it for this event and part of it was for legislative committee uh, meetings uh, recently we've uh, educated ourselves a little bit more about the um, the Black Caucus. And I don't know if they're still calling it that. No, it's the Colorado Latino Caucus now. I forgot that if they changed the name, but, um, and those, you know, as you might expect to have um, a, a fairly significant membership and they seem to have regular meetings. Mm -hmm. That, that those are two that might, might be more self-organizing than some of the other ones are. Um, and given the, challenges that we continue to have year after year in keeping legislators interested in aging issues. Um, it might get off the ground slowly, but, um, you know, I think we could build um, a stronger caucus than we've had in the past, but we're definitely going to have to start out with, with some, um, with more staff involvement. Um, and one other example, I think I recall, uh, I don't know if it was last year before the pandemic or if it was in the 2019 session, but uh, um, one of the uh, best attended aging caucuses that I recall was one that uh, Alzheimer's Association basically took over to organize. And um, they brought in speakers and, and so forth. And we had uh, one of the large house committee rooms downstairs I think pretty darn full. Um, so, and the other part of that too is like with a lot of it, like even like these events, um, a big part of getting the legislators involved is the follow-up. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's not good enough to, you know, get them to say, yeah, sure, I'll be on the aging caucus. And then they never hear from you <laughs> or, or you send them an agenda for the next meeting and don't follow up. So of course they get busy and they don't show up. So there's all those kinds of things that I think factor into it. Rich. <clears throat> Thank you. Rich, this Lying is the it's a really complex uh, project, job. Um, and organizing a caucus is fundamentally lobbying. And um, all you need is a handful of members of the legislature to be a caucus. And everyone in that legislature is either over 50 or has a parent that's over 50. Everyone has an interest. And the trick is to figure out what their interest is. And if we can get three members or four members who are committed to a handful of issues, not the whole panoply, just, you know, maybe four, um, with one of them being dementia, because then we can rope in AARP. Um, there's a real basis for organizing in the legislature and preserving. And the fundamental issue is preserving funding for the programs that are important. Thank you. Bill, you wanted to say something? Well, um, Rich and Bob, uh, you know, my thought is uh, to, to find uh, or gather those that would also be interested in an older Coloradans caucus. Uh, the AARP, the Alzheimer's Association, C4A, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, uh, as well as SAPCA. And I think uh, with those five folks or five organizations just getting together and saying, hey, um, who else is interested? And try and get the combined um, resources of the five organizations and say, okay, who, how can we move this to the next level? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile discussion to have. And, and, and um, in fact, we've had that conversation in, in recent years and never have gotten around to actually doing anything about it. But um, they're, they're actually way before my time, this is history now, but I remember uh, some of the folks who were involved in senior lobby at the time I first got involved, um, talked about um, back, God, it was probably back in the 80s and maybe into the 90s when, when there was a, like, I think they called it the, Colorado Congress of Senior Organizations or something like that, but they had, it was, a, it was more of a statewide organization. Um, and, uh, and that might have actually been one that predated the senior lobby. Um, but uh, uh, so some of these things, you know, happen because maybe they'd been tried before, but the people involved either quite frankly passed away or, or moved on. And they, then uh, the people who were left didn't pick them up. And so I think it's, it's instructive that those of us who've been involved more recently sort of end up in the same place thinking, geez, how can we get much more of a, of a, of a statewide coalition going here? Uh, oh. It's a lot of work, um, but it's, you know, I think it's definitely um, uh, a valuable uh, effort to try. Well, Rich, if we wanted to have a, a coalition of uh, those five organizations and said we want to recognize uh, a DNR in each chamber um, and with this session um, and take that as the short run and then look for more organization for the 22 legislative session, um, that, that would be progress. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be progress if we could just get those groups together and decide that we're actually going to do something. Mm -hmm. um, the um, as Rich was saying, I mean, it, you know, having been involved in this organization now for look, the last three or four years, um, 
finding people to do things is the hard part. So getting um, a person or persons who are, who are willing to help organize and do all the things that you have to do to make it successful. I mean, Rick mentioned follow-up. Well, follow-up takes time yeah. and you have to be relentless about follow-up in order to get people to show up you know, and I'm talking about legislators here primarily to get them to show up somewhere and, and actually have a conversation, you know, have an agenda, you know, the whole bit. And then you follow up after that, too. And then how many of those meetings are you going to have in, in a given session? You know, probably not more than two or three, uh, given the restrictions on time. And so and then, you know, what can you do in the offset off session? You have to decide that, too. So. Um, you know, my, my experience with, with uh, organizations with volunteers is that there are a lot of suggestions that get made, but, you know, who's going to do the work? Yeah, that's so, really the key. Yeah. Because it's easy to make suggestions. You know, the, the hard part is actually doing something with the suggestion. Mm -hmm. So, um, which gets back to the whole volunteering thing again. So, um. You know, uh, so if anybody has any uh, thoughts about, you know, if you would like to volunteer or if you know somebody that you would like to like to volunteer <laughs> as a volunteer, uh, you know, let's put them forward. But I mean, I, I'd love to do some of this stuff, but, you know, it, it, it does take people and time. So, yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. And I, I mean, I still think, I mean, I, I can certainly, as someone who's been with Senior Lobby, at least <laughs> probably 17 years, maybe. And I know more than 10 years on the board. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm really proud of where, where it is today. I mean, uh, and, and maybe when I first start, started getting involved, it was a kind of an interesting time because, um, there were a lot of so-called old timers, if you will. Some, some of them were like original senior lobby members. Uh, the lobby, I think, officially uh, was founded in 1980 and uh, was, was, became very active and very well known at the Capitol and had statewide representation and um, was very well respected. But as I meant, started to mention, by time when you got into the, say, the early to mid 2000s, a lot of those people were gone. And there were new people that had come in and some of them were really, really good, but, but a lot of them were sort of like the people Bob was talking about who like to come to meetings and debate issues and make suggestions about what other people should do. <laughs> um, but as far as actually doing work for the organization, there, that was starting to fall off. And so it's really been in the, in the last 10 years where I've seen um, the lobby really start to pick up and really get more active, uh, get, you know, get board members who are willing to do work, like put on the older Coloradans week and, uh, and bring people from outside the board to also do work for us. Um, and so I just think um, for all the criticisms or self-criticisms we, we can rightly have, we should maybe take at least five seconds to pat ourselves on the back <laughs> uh, and say, I think we've laid a good, a good foundation uh, for moving forward and, and to continue this conversation and maybe make uh, some decisions out of the discussions here uh, on, on some, some new projects we can start to work on. Yeah, so um, you know, think about the whole volunteering thing. And uh, I mean, it doesn't have, it's not a full time job. I mean, it's, it, it, it seems like it sometimes, but um, you know, if, if you can figure out a way to carve out a few hours a week, uh, two hours a week, or what, whatever it is, um, you know, we have, uh, and somebody mentioned earlier, you know, having a stipend for for volunteers, I mean, and that's something that that we're starting to put together. I mean, we've written, I've, you know, we've written some job descriptions for people that 
to be volunteers, to actually get a small stipend, to you know to help encourage people to volunteer um, and get a, a little bit of pay for it. So it's you know if that's what it takes, you know, to get people engaged, then you know that's what we'll have to do. But um, if I can insert here. Um, I read a bunch of books on volunteering and they talked about the difference in consideration between the person getting paid and what the volunteer kind of really won. And in this one, there were many different views, but the one I liked is he had three words. They need a feeling of autonomy. Number two, they want to master some new skill. And number three, they have some purpose of their own that they're interested in. And that's, they need consideration, but it isn't monetarily. Yeah. Yeah, that's Bob, I have a question. Are you looking for volunteers for Colorado Senior Lobby or I'm a little confused about the volunteer conversation? Yes, we are. So, and, and I don't know, I mean, Laura, Kinder, are you still on this? Because it seems to me that you've had on these, like, you know, Laura Kinder has sparked the change and they're amazing at getting volunteers. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting some amazing volunteers from Boomers Leading Change. Mm -hmm. As opposed to you all having to do the recruiting, it's like go to people who are already doing the recruiting for volunteers, just to throw. Yeah. No, that, that, you're, you're right. Laura, do, do, do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> well, um, spark the change. Sorry, Laura. Laura. <laughs> I was just, I no. saw you on the call and I was like, we've got the volunteer guru and expert on the call now. <laughs> uh, well, once again, working with the team of people. Um, Definitely Spark the Change Colorado is, I think, a great place for us to um, put up volunteer opportunities. We, um, you know, we responded to COVID-19, had a huge response um, to that, and um, we're really very willing to work. Um, and once again, putting together a, a next 50 grant to expand how we present our website uh, to individuals. I definitely put up information about Older Coloradoian Week um, on our website uh, so that people would be aware of it. Um, but we could target um, people who are 55 and better so that they get all of those opportunities. And uh, working with the Points of Light Foundation, we really understand that advocacy is a huge way that people spend their time. It's not just the direct volunteer service, but it's also um, how you vote, who you campaign for. Um, it's the demonstrations. It's it's the Black Lives Matter movement. It's, it's all of those things. And so um, I would love to have conversations or direct you to the right person. Uh, in our organization to have those conversations and uh, move forward, because I think the momentum is definitely there. Um, my ears definitely picked up um, with the volunteering uh, aspect. Um, we were just awarded seven RSVP um, uh, programs throughout the state. And so we're going into rural counties. Uh, bringing in those federal dollars to help support um, our main focus is food insecurity. So um, love to have conversations and uh, Boomers Leading Change is another excellent organization and there's many more. Yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, and, and Bob, I guess this also goes to the community organizing aspect because so many older people both look at Spark the Change and at Boomers Leading Change for volunteer and civic engagement opportunities, spreading the word about Colorado Senior Lobby and your work through that mm -hmm. is also then creating that advocacy force that you want showing up at, mm -hmm. hopefully when you come out to support the changes to the anti-discrimination bill that will strengthen AIDS discrimination laws. But that was the hint, <laughs> Jody, Colorado Senior Lobby, Jody's been involved in drafting this, so. Well, I know she has, yeah. 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 Uh, we, we have we, we have some of our most excellent volunteers on this call today, so uh, we, we really appreciate that. Um, 
<clears throat> okay. Well, if, is there anything else, folks? Um, we will uh, we'll do some follow up on this idea of forming this coalition. Um, you know, the um, SAPCA, the C4A, AARP, uh, Alzheimer's, Spark to Change, Boomers. Um, when I look at boomers, I mean, uh, what they seem to be emphasized is more health related stuff, but you know, you don't see it that way. Okay. They started oh, out. Uh, oh. Health, health is what's important when you <laughs> get to be 65 and you get Medicare. And some people, have, this is the first time they've had health insurance. Health is important. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I would I, say, Bob, boomers. Based um, of all this stuff. Okay. Um, boomers started out as boomers leading change in health. So there's been that lingering um, healthcare emphasis, but now they're doing both um, workforce development and volunteerism, not only on health, uh, very much on workforce, uh, very much on early childhood, kind of intergenerational stuff. So I think that there are, um, you know, a number of ways, and I know they're very um, supportive of the work we're doing and changing the narrative on, especially workforce issues because okay. a lot of older people involved with them want jobs that pay. So. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. I mean, I, I've talked to Kelly Brown a few times, but um, yeah. not about this, so. <clears throat> Maybe people could put a note in the chat and say, please follow up with me about the caucus. Well, any, anyone I'll who's- follow up with you too. I'll definitely do it. Yeah. Anyone who's interested, just uh, put your name in there. That's fine. Precisely. Yes. Something being accurate. Yes. yes. And it doesn't all have to be in person. So we, we've got to step in, volunteer, and figure out what they want, not what your project is. What do sure. they want? Yeah. Well, that that's fine. But you know, come forward and say what you want. I mean, I, you know, I I can't read anybody's mind. You know, it's like they have to say what they want. And if, if there's a fit, then, hey, great. Yeah. You know, and Bob, I, I'm just going to say, and this is, you know, my experience with boomers. I just put out, like, and it sounds like you're doing job descriptions. I put out exactly what I want. Like, I need someone 10 hours a week to do exactly this, blah, blah. So it kind of then attracts only people who want to do that. And, you know, part of it is, so, for example, Jody, um, I'm looking for someone to follow up. Every time we do those call to action forums and we get a hundred people who say, yes, I want to be involved. I'm like, I can't call a hundred no, uh, people. Exactly. <laughs> so my person that I'm getting is going to be following up with all those people who, you know, keep raising their hand and saying, yeah, I want to get involved. Great. Yeah, so. oh, I, I, that's great. Yeah, and then, you know, we do have those and we're going to start putting them out. So yeah. it's. But you should all be so proud of this. This was so cool. This was yeah. so, oh, you should be really that. proud. You really should. I, I've learned a lot and, uh, and we had a great team of people that put it together. So uh, I, I, I see uh, there's Jody. Um, hey, Jody. Yeah, Chris, Chris Gierken, who I, I think just went away, but uh, yeah, Corinne Hall. Corinne. <laughs> Corinne. Kelly. Kelly. Kelly's here. Sarah yeah. Beth. Um, yeah. Charlie, Sarah Bath. Charlie, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have a this young woman named Charlie Johnson who just kind of came out of nowhere and said, "Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to help out." <laughs> so, so she's. We said, she's, "Of course, absolutely." Right. <laughs> what would you like to do? Well, so I, I'd like to do this. So, okay, well, you can do that. And she does it so well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and Bob, in order, can I just do a little shameless plug though for uh, membership with Colorado Senior Lobby? Um, thank you, Janine, for saying you know great things about the week. It was it was terrific. Our first time out of the shoot. But in order to do these types of programs, we have to have members, and it, it does cost money to do these things. And so I've put in the chat room the link to. Uh, join and you can join certainly as an individual. It's a very inexpensive investment of $40 per year. Um, and it's probably less than your Starbucks bill. So um, if you can click on that link and join us, um, 
this way we can continue to do these types of educational opportunities for folks throughout the state. So we would greatly appreciate that. And if you're associated with an organization um, that would like to join, there's also an organizational level. So the, the link is in the box and hope to see all of your names as newest members that we can welcome at next month's meeting. So thanks for your participation in this week. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Jody. And thanks to everybody uh, for your participation. And uh, it's been a great time. I mean, I've learned a lot. Yeah, for sure. So you all go off and have a, a great rest of your week. Enjoy. Absolutely, all of you. All right. <laughs> Take care. All right. Bye bye.